In this video, we're going to talk about a highly controversial subject, the idea that we can deliberately change the world's climate to combat the effects of global warming. And this idea is called geoengineering. And in addition to this video, which is going to focus more on the physics of how geoengineering works, I highly recommend that you check out my friend Feather's video series on the subject. He's been doing a whole bunch of different videos on different techniques that we could use to this end. And go check them out because they're pretty awesome and I've been doing a little bit of work on them, fact checking some of the sums. So yeah, they're pretty cool. Last time we extensively looked at global warming and climate change and found that the observed warming over the past century or so is directly linked to CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Now, the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, the less energy that the Earth emits into space, causing an energy imbalance which results in the Earth warming. Now that description of global warming suggests two different solutions to the problem, so let's look at those one at a time. Solution one. The energy imbalance which is causing the warming is itself caused by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So to reduce the amount of warming, let's remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Solution 2. The Earth is emitting less energy into space than it used to, while the amount of energy that it receives from the Sun has remained constant. Ish. So to remove the energy imbalance, let's reduce the amount of energy that the Earth is absorbing from the Sun. Now, both of these solutions probably rank on the plausibility scale for you somewhere between impractical and absolutely insane, but a huge amount of research has been done on the subject, and it's more possible than you're probably thinking. Now, one of the people doing the research on the subject is my colleague Angus Ferraro, who is an associate research fellow here at the University of Exeter, and I interviewed him all about the topic. So, over to Angus to talk about the first of these solutions. So that's the easiest thing to do. That's probably what people would say. It's like, well, why can't we just uh, create a giant, um, some kind of catalytic thing that will just, you know, blow air through it and suck carbon dioxide uh, out of the air? And in, in theory, that's quite possible, and it can be done right now. In fact, it is being done right now. There's, uh, there are some companies that construct these kind of weird, wonderful machines that do this. Um, it's a really cool one, it basically looks like a giant bank of jet engines and all it's doing is blowing air over this stuff which chemically removes CO2 from the atmosphere. The main problem with that is that the energy requirements for something like that are very very large and that makes it very expensive. Um, some of the more kind of weird, weird and wonderful proposals for this kind of thing would be, okay, so we need somewhere with abundant cheap energy, but it doesn't really matter where it is other than that because CO2 is well mixed around the atmosphere, as long as it has access to air, then it can remove CO2. So people propose, okay, we'll just have these entirely automated uh, installations out in deserts with huge solar panel arrays all around them to satisfy the power requirements. But um, anything on this scale is going to be very, very expensive. So if we think about the sheer mass of CO2 that we need to draw down, gigatons and gigatons of CO2, that would be very expensive, no matter how you set up your um, energy supply system. So at the moment, CO2 removal from the atmosphere just isn't feasible on the scale that we're talking about. But it's definitely, definitely worth researching, and hopefully sometime in the near future, new technologies will allow it to play a significant role in cooling the climate. But what about solution number two? Right, so if you think about what's going on with the energy balance of the Earth at the moment, what's happening is carbon dioxide is reducing the amount of radiation that the Earth is emitting to space. So that means we've got an imbalance of energy at the top of the atmosphere and that that's causing the planet to warm up. So we need to bring that energy balance back into balance. Uh, and one way to do that is just to reduce the amount of energy coming in so that then the reduced amount going out is balanced by a reduced amount coming in. And so to do that, we would try and essentially dim the sun. A um, couple of ways we might be able to do that. One, which is extremely expensive and probably not going to happen in the, well, in this century, is to launch uh, a constellation of satellites out into space, basically just stick it in between the Earth and the sun. And so what this would do is basically reflect a small percentage of the sun's radiation. It only needs to be about one or two percent to achieve the kind of coolings of a tenth of a degree or something that we'd want to achieve. So um, you could stick some satellites in space and do it that way, but um, sticking anything in space is really expensive. So that probably isn't going to work. Most of the ideas grouped under solar radiation management use what we refer to as aerosols. 
Yeah, so when people think aerosols, they think the spray can stuff, right? The, um, what you use for um, deodorant, whatever. And that's not 100% far from the truth because well, when we talk about aerosols and atmospheric physics, we talk about tiny, tiny particles in the air that can be made up of anything. So they could be um, small amounts of um, sulfuric acid, droplets of sulfuric acid, um, or they could be bits of carbon, bits of soot. They could be various organic compounds emitted by plants. The things that these uh, aerosols have in common is that they interfere with the flow of radiation and the energy going in and out of the uh, Earth system. So these aerosols then act to make the Earth more reflective, reducing the amount of energy that we absorb from the sun and so readdressing the energy balance. And this happens in nature already. So let's mimic a natural process as only makes sense just on a bigger scale to produce a significant effect. So number one, we could mimic volcanic eruptions, which basically emit, um, in fact, they basically produce sulfuric acid aerosol in the, in the stratosphere. And this sulfuric acid aerosol acts like a cooling haze, which uh, reflects some sunlight. Or we could mimic things like ship tracks, which enhance the brightness of clouds way down near the surface. So when you look at a satellite image of the, of the ocean and you can um, okay, so if you look at a satellite image of the ocean and then you track where the ships go, you can see these kind of white, whiter regions where they go through the clouds and the particulates they produce from their uh, chimneys basically brighten the clouds there. So we'd end up with brighter marine clouds and these would also reflect more solar radiation out of space. Most research has concentrated on the first of these two ideas, and more specifically has looked at the effects of injecting additional aerosols into the stratosphere. Now as well as being dynamically more stable than the troposphere below it, the stratosphere has the advantage of being almost completely dry. So aerosols injected there would stay airborne much longer than they would in the troposphere, where they would just get rained out. Now somewhat unbelievably, this is where this comes in. Because we're not just limited to injecting sulfuric acid as an aerosol, we could inject anything into the stratosphere that produces a similar effect. And one aerosol that's received a lot of attention in particular is titanium oxide. Titanium, titanium dioxide, otherwise known as titania, is um, another... Well, so you could make an aerosol out of it. It's not an aerosol we find in great quantities around the atmosphere at the moment, because it's basically a mineral. It's called rutile mostly, and it's actually surprisingly cheap. So everyone thinks titanium is like this really expensive stuff. Titanium is, titanium dioxide is this dirt cheap ore that you find uh, around the globe. Um, the advantage is it's incredibly reflective. So it's used in food a lot for things like toothpaste, things like aspirin and all your other white tablets. To get that nice white shininess, they use titanium dioxide. So it's E171, I think, is the, is the additive number. And yeah, in theory, you could grind it up and spray it into the atmosphere and achieve a similar cooling effect to um, sulfate, but with this solid particle that you can uh, control a lot better and is obviously a little bit more benign than sulfuric acid. Geoengineering has the potential to reverse some of the worst environmental damage that we're doing to the planet, but doesn't fundamentally address the root cause of the problem, CO2 in the atmosphere. And in addition to this, it has some downsides. One of the fundamental downsides of using geoengineering in this manner, solar radiation management, to um, counteract the global warming from CO2 concentrations, is that if you, even if you were to do it perfectly, exactly cancel out the global average temperature change, you would end up reducing uh, global precipitation. And that's something, so there are, there are some results in climate science that we're less sure of. We're very sure of this reduction in precipitation. It basically comes from the way that CO2 affects the radiation balance of the atmosphere relative to the way that uh, solar radiation does. Basically, solar radiation doesn't get, get absorbed by the atmosphere, whereas CO2 does. This leads to a different differential atmospheric heating between the surface and the top of the troposphere that affects the way rain is formed. Basically, you end up with a reduction in global precipitation. Of course, no one ever experiences global mean precipitation, so it's very hard to say what will happen on a more regional scale. So we tend to run some climate model experiments for that. And the general consensus is among the climate models is that probably there will be some regional changes in patterns of precipitation and uh, patterns of warm and cold regions 
under geoengineering, but that actually the regional changes will probably be smaller than the ones that you would get under an unmitigated global warming scenario. So although there will be regional changes, if you think about the regional changes that you might be seeing in the future anyway, um, that might, might not be so bad. As for the big question of whether or not we will use geoengineering, is not for me to say. I am just a PhD student and I don't know everything. Personally, I don't think that we're going to use solar radiation management anytime soon. There's just too many question marks associated with it at this point. But I hope that we can use CO2 removal in the very near future with new technologies. Now, for more information about this and the ongoing debate about the use of geoengineering, stay tuned to the channel because very soon there's going to be a video coming out about whether the COP21 climate meeting in Paris this December should consider the use of geoengineering, where a bunch of world-leading academics from Exeter chime in. So you didn't see much of me in this video, which is probably a good thing. Instead, Angus covered what geoengineering is, deliberately changing the Earth's radiative properties. CO2 removal from the atmosphere, which we'd like to do, but we can't really do it because it's not practical yet. Solar radiation management, which is practical, but we're not quite sure if we'd like to do it yet. And the many issues involved in using these techniques. This was the last video in this crash course series on atmospheric physics, and I very, very much hope that you've enjoyed it, and that if you've watched many or all of the episodes, that you now feel you've got a firmer grasp of the basics of the field. Now, if you have feedback on the series, please, please leave that down below in the comments. I'm always trying to improve my content, so if there's stuff that you liked or you didn't like about this series, say so down below, and I can try and make things better next time. If you'd like there to be a next time and you'd like me to do more of these kind of series, then also please, please say so down in the comments and you can suggest the topics that you'd like me to do. But also, if you'd like that, then the clearest message for me to do more of this kind of content in the future is for this series and these videos to get lots of views and to do very well. So if you want me to do more of this kind of thing, please share these videos and this, the playlist of these videos to your schools, your teachers, your friends. And if it does well, then that says to me, to go and do more of this kind of stuff, which I'd like to do. So if you'd like that too, please do share these videos. Lastly, if you'd like to support this series and me more directly, then you can do so via its Connors page. And if you like the video, then please do like it and subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching. Okay, so here's my workbook. It's important because it's a book and I like books and it's got my work in. That's my laptop, which has got the scripts for the Crash Course videos in. That's my Japanese piece, Lily. Always important to keep that around because it keeps the air oxygenated. This is not the time to introduce science. It's an interesting thing, but I sort of believe it. You know, when you're in a negotiation, say you're buying a t-shirt at a market store, 